That was a test one. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to the Committee on Women and Gender Equities Oversight Hearing on Menstrual Equity in New York City. I'm Council Member Dharma V. Diaz, Committee Chair, and pronouns are she, her, and hers. First, thank you to everyone who's here to testify today. This is the committee's first in-person oversight hearing since before the pandemic, as well as my first hearing as committee chair. I have long been concerned about the issue, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. So let's get to it. Menstrual is a normal and healthy part of life for most women. Roughly half of the female population are productive age and menstrual each month for about two to seven days. Menstrual products are also known as period products. Also personal care products used during menstrual and, and other bodily functions related to the vulva and vagina. Even though period products, including but not limited to pads and tampons, are necessary as toilet paper and soap, and the United Nations has declared the right to menstrual hygiene as a human right. Many menstruating New Yorkers lack access to menstrual products due to cost. Moreover, due to stigma, many face unnecessary barriers to access, and studies have shown that lack of awareness of good menstrual product practices can result in serious health consequences. In 2016, the Council's passage of local laws 82, 83, and 84, New York became the first U.S. city to pass comprehensive legislation related to menstrual equity. This package of legislation increased access to period products for individuals incarcerated in the Department of Correction jails. Human Resources Administration shelter residents is used under the care of children's services facilities, including transgender, intersex, and gender nonconforming New Yorkers and Department of Education students. However, advocates have revealed flaws in implementation of these laws, from the provision of a one-size option and low-quality products that fail to unnecessary barriers to access, such as not to have the products and appropriate repticles, areas where they're dispensed, ready and available in bathrooms. Committee staff have also been informed that there is a need in elementary schools. I started at the age of nine. Therefore, I plead with the city of New York and all listening today to please lower the age. Which has, in city jails, there have been reports of inconsistent access to menstrual products that has led to pads and tampons becoming bargaining chips used to maintain control by correction officers or traded among incarcerated women. This is inappropriate and unconceivable. I am so shocked. Prior to joining the council, I was a director of housing services for a nonprofit shelter in, in, in New York City. So I'm very familiar with the quality issues that the city provided menstrual periods. And I share with you, you know, just for the committee, if you have not seen it before, so here is what was given to a youth, um, and then a variable of a youth, <laughs> and then adults. What I was able, one way that I was able to get my clients in shelter to use them is I convinced them to use two pads to one tampon and check themselves about 45 minutes at a, at per day, per hour, which is definitely beyond comprehension for me. While period poverty, a term contained coined by Jennifer Wise Wolf, who may be here today, has been a long-standing issue. It is now even more pronounced that in some women have the brunt of COVID-19 pandemic. From job loss to food insecurity, in support of girls, a nonprofit that provides free tampons and pads has reported 35% increase in requests for products and has collected and distributed over 2 million products since March 2020. At today's hearing, I am interested in an overview of the implementation of 2016 law, including information on the recruitment and distribution period products. I am also interested in receiving testimony that can inform better policy in order to achieve real menstrual equity in New York City. Before we hear from the administration, I'd like to thank Terry Coxham, my communications director, Karen Terry, my chief of staff, and the staff that often works really hard to prepare me for a hearing, hearing, the sergeants and arms who are working to run this hearing and keep us safe, and committee staff for their work in preparing this hearing, including 
Brenda McKinney, Committee Counsel, Chloe Rivera, Senior Policy Analyst. Thank you for Chloe. Esther Wright, the female unit head. Finally, I want to acknowledge committee members who are present. The one and only Helen Rosenthal, thank you. <laughs> now the committee senior analyst, Chloe, will swear in administration. Thank you. If you can raise your right hand and respond by pressing the button on your mics. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Uh, you may begin. Good morning, Chair Diaz. Good morning, Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you all for having us here today. And as always, thank you for your support for the work of the Commission on Gender Equity and certainly for your leadership in this space in the city. I am Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director of New York City's Commission on Gender Equity. In this role, I also serve as an advisor to the mayor and first lady on policies and issues affecting gender equity in New York City for all girls, women, gender non-binary persons, and persons of trans experience, regardless of their ability, age, ethnicity, or race, regardless of their faith, gender expression, or immigrant status, or sexual orientation and socioeconomic status. My colleague, Erin Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner of Intergovernmental Affairs and Legislative Affairs for the Department of Social Services, and I, we welcome this opportunity to discuss the administration's menstrual equity efforts since the enactment of the 2016 laws. The de Blasio administration is and has been steadfast in its commitment to, pro to promote equity, excellence, and fairness for all New Yorkers. From combating workplace sexual harassment and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, to enshrining rights for pregnant and parenting New Yorkers, to ensuring access to inclusive services and paid safe leave for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, this administration has converted its words into action to become a leader in protecting the rights of all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or background. It is within this context that CGE works to create lasting institutional commitment to tearing down equity barriers across New York City. CGE carries out its activities across three areas of focus within a human rights framework and using an intersectional lens. Our areas of focus are economic mobility and opportunity, where we strive to create a city where, all, where people of all gender identities and expressions live economically secure lives and have access to opportunities to thrive. Our second area of focus is health and reproductive justice, we strive to foster a city free from gender and race-based health disparities. And finally, our third area of focus is safety, where we seek to build a city free from gender and race-based violence. As you noted, menstruation is a natural monthly occurrence experienced by over half the population for much of their lives. And yet stigma and lack of access to menstrual products is still pervasive within our society. Menstrual equity is the equal, safe, and affordable access to menstrual products, as well as ensuring that girls, women, gender non-binary persons, and persons of trans experience have the support and the education to make informed choices on how to take care of their menstrual health. Although CGE addresses menstrual equity primarily within its health and reproductive justice focus area, we acknowledge that matters of economic mobility and opportunity and matters of safety are inextricably linked to menstrual equity and deeply affect one's quality of life. Menstrual inequity, therefore, is a gender and reproductive justice issue which disproportionately affects marginalized girls, women, gender non-binary persons, and persons of trans experience who are students, or living in poverty, or homeless and or experiencing housing insecurity, are justice involved, and are in our foster care system. Nationally, nearly a quarter of students experience period poverty, 
according to a 2021 national survey on the state of the period, with lower income and students of color, particularly Latinx, disproportionately bearing the impact of lack of access to menstrual products. Students overwhelmingly agreed that too many of their peers miss school time because they do not have the period product they need. In addition, to access, in addition to access to menstrual products, students are also, also cited struggling with period stigma in their school environment and their need for more informed and open sexual health education that includes in-depth menstrual health education. People living in poverty are directly affected by lack of access to menstrual products. It is estimated that women, girls, non-binary persons, and people of trans experience who menstruate will have to spend well over $1,000 in their lifetime on menstrual products, although I think it's much more given my personal experience, but well over. Even those who may have access to public assistance programs such as WIC or SNAP still face challenges as those public benefits are not permitted to cover the cost of menstrual products. This is particularly problematic because many people need access to menstrual products after birth solely because of postpartum bleeding and discharge. People experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness also often struggle with access to menstrual products. Despite the positive research nationally, we know that some persons experiencing housing insecurity face barriers, such as limitations on access to soap or a shower or facility availability. It is also well documented that non-binary persons and people of trans experience can face particularly particular challenges in sex separated spaces, sometimes reporting being turned away, harassed or assaulted when seeking a place to sleep. Many avoid shelters, sometimes based on the perception that shelters are unsafe and unsanitary. Furthermore, compared to the general population, persons of trans experience and non-binary people are more than twice as likely to live in poverty and more than three times as likely to be unemployed. Even in the absence of financial hardships, Non-binary persons and persons of trans experience bear the constant risk of violence and harassment in shared bathrooms and other public spaces. So, faced with barriers of poverty, homelessness and housing insecurity and gender discrimination, girls, women, gender non-binary persons and persons of trans experience are often more likely to reuse, prolong use, or misuse menstrual products or other items such as diapers, toilet papers, etc., to manage their period. All of which can lead to infection, infertility, or life-threatening diseases such as toxic shock syndrome. No one should have to compromise their education, economic opportunity, or physical or mental health because they cannot equitably access the period products they need. CGE testified in support of the council's menstrual health equity bills, I'm sorry, menstrual equity bills in 2016, and supported the state's elimination of the tampon tax that quickly followed the council's action. Since the laws were enacted in 2016, agencies have implemented procurement and distribution processes to get the products to New Yorkers in accordance with the laws. The administration was also able quickly to modify these processes for COVID-19 when, in March 2020, New York City became the epicenter of the pandemic, resulting in sudden economic hardship for many New Yorkers, including increased incidences of period poverty. Students who previously relied on obtaining menstrual products in school were left without this resource in the context of a sudden shift to remote learning. In households where one or more parent may have lost a job, the cost of menstrual products could add unprecedented financial stress on families. Heeding the call of student advocates, elected officials, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene 
collaborated to distribute sanitary napkins to New Yorkers through local food banks. In addition, the Department of Education ensured that menstrual products were available at food distribution centers located at public schools. As we move forward, we hope to ensure the availability and fair access of menstrual health products. This work is now more important than ever. We are proud that New York City is among the first in the nation to address the issues of menstrual equity and period poverty by passing local laws 82, 83, and 84 of 2016, ensuring free menstrual products in schools, correctional facilities, and shelters. To further support implementation of these laws and to address any gaps that exist or may arise, CGE will continue to collaborate with our colleagues at the Department of Education, Department of Corrections, Departments of Homeless Services, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services by convening a working group on menstrual equity within the Gender Equity Interagency Partnership which is a collaborative that advances intersectional gender equitable policies across city agencies. We anticipate convening this working group beginning October 2021 and will examine current practices, their efficacy in distributing mental products, menstrual products to New Yorkers. We will also explore additional ways to meet New Yorkers' menstrual equity needs citywide. In conclusion, whether the lack of menstrual hygiene products derives from scarce funds, insufficient sexual health education, or other barriers of access, no one should go without necessary menstrual products. Everyone should have the opportunity to make informed decisions with fair access to the products that best meet the needs of their bodies. Menstrual equity is a key issue at the intersection of public health human rights, and gender and reproductive justice, and must be addressed to advance gender equity for New Yorkers. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I look forward to continued conversations on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, very informative. Thank you. Before we move forward, I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, Farrah Thank you. Another question? I'm going to kind of start backwards from what I last heard you say, um, and it's in reference to moving forward and the committee that's being put together as of October. Yes. When was that decided or created that there was the need for it? It, it was created through discussions as in, in our preparations. I must say that for, for this, this dialogue, uh, our agencies have been working diligently in providing the services. They have processes. They are in communication with each other. Um, they also have procurement processes. They have communication processes with the populations they serve. But um, quite frankly, we recognize that this can be strengthened. And we think the, issue, the, the key missing piece is consistent collaboration which is a unique place for the Commission on Gender Equity. I think this is the sort of work the Commission in its current structure was created under the de Blasio administration. And as we've built out capacity, this is the type of work that we want to do, to foster greater dialogue, addressing a particular issue, and developing solutions. Equally important is measuring impact. And this is a particular challenge in the area of menstrual equity, as one must guarantee, I believe, and I think my colleagues would agree, the privacy of the end user. So we want to be able to better document how the product reaches our end user and, how, and their level of satisfaction with it. But also we want to guarantee their privacy in that process. I think that requires coordination and it requires dialogue, it requires interaction with the users, all protecting their privacy. And so we want to be able to build on that, and we think that this work group is the approach to doing, one approach. I'm certain that others can develop. Who is the point person? The Commission on Gender Equity, and I'm, I'm its executive director. It, just, it seems like a lot of people 
a lot of conversation, and I would hope that from 2016 to now, we've learned. As it's clear to us, it's a need and a necessity, and if we've learned anything during COVID, is that it has to be now, 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 now. How often does your committee plan to meet? And what level of your agenda and your pie chart do you see this being addressed? Well, this will fit within our health and reproductive justice focus area. So it's one of our top three focus areas. Okay. And, um, and I also as well chair the Mayor's Sexual Health Education Task Force, which will sunset in May 2022. But we see the synergy as well between that issue, at least in schools, right? Yes. To really, as you alluded, as you mentioned in your testimony, we may need to start earlier. What process ought that to be? How can we, across city agencies, work to develop those processes and that are user-friendly? Uh, you know, it, it's such a sensitive area, but how do we make them user-friendly? How do we make menstrual products readily available? How do we ensure that they are transformational and supportive of the lives of the young women that we serve, gender non-binary individuals, wherever they may be located, that they can feel that that issue is addressed fully in their life circumstances. Before I move on to my colleagues can ask questions, is today the first time you've heard where a child in elementary school may be in need of sanitary napkins? And that could be to either of you, please. I, you know, I wouldn't say so. I, DOE did not communicate that to us. I won't speak for them at this moment, but we can address that. They have definitely heard of other issues, um, but spe not specifically that issue. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rosenthal? Yeah. Um, actually, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you so much, uh, Director and Deputy Commissioner, for being here. Really appreciate all your time. Such an important topic. Actually, my first question is just a, um, uh, question of just knowledge. Um, the chair's question just now about element, the need for menstrual products in elementary schools, I just want to make sure, is, was that question based on a reality that the menstrual products are not available in elementary schools, but they are in middle and high schools? In accordance with the law, sure. grade six through Okay, all five. right. Sounds like Could we need provide. either a tweak to the law or well, some common sense implementation as in practice. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, so, um, you know, I similarly, as we all have, have heard stories that are just horrific about what's happening in the jails, um, our schools and the homeless shelters. So with that in mind, starting with the jails, my understanding is that pads are given out upon request but not uh, a lot of pads and that it's uh, um, uh, one has to request over and over and over and over again for pads uh, but tampons are not distributed and must be purchased at the commissary. Um, I'm wondering is that it, that feels to me as someone who has menstruated in my life um, as silliness, as a rule that would not be written by somebody uh, who has menstruated in their life. And I'm wondering what, in what way is that meeting the requirement of menstrual equity and what, um, what accountability and where is the accountability for the jail system if that is a reality for menstruating people uh, in jail? In our discussions with our colleagues at DOC, you are correct. It's, menstrual products are available upon request but I think what you're pointing out is how onerous it is to consistently have to request every time you need. And so we will raise that issue with them because um, you know, one may think you're being quite 
um, open by leaving it to the agency of the individual, but there, there are other pre pressures created. We also provide the products to LGBTQ individuals through the LGBTQ unit, affairs unit. And uh, we were informed that um, tampon, tampons are now purchased. And so because of a request made by uh, one of our incarcerated individuals. So just say that, just Omar, I recently. couldn't quite hear you, um, Director. So tampons have to be purchased. Is no, that accurate? That this, the, the jails purchase them, the system purchased them. The, the Department system of Corrections. purchases tampons, right. But, and then do they sell them in the commissary or do they give no, them upon request? My expectation, my understanding I was not clear that it was sold in the commissary. I, my assumption is that it has been distributed upon right. request. I would double check on that but and I, maybe ask you. for a list of the products available at the commissary. Um, my understanding is that um, it's, uh, it, that is not the reality okay. for menstruating people at uh, the jail system. We'll definitely follow up, thank I'd you. Like to Councilmember Bonaro and Kalos. Thank you. Um, may I continue for just another Please, minute? I okay. It's beyond understanding for me. I'm bewildered to know that you have this information, but the administration doesn't. Well, it sounds like the administration is being told one thing by the Department of Corrections, uh -huh. as opposed to the reality that I'm hearing right. from the advocates who represent women in. Uh, the jail system. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for bringing that to light. It doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. Thank you. No, it doesn't make sense to anyone. Um, appreciate that. Similarly, um, um, Deputy Commissioner, if you could let me know if we could dive into the details about the availability of menstrual products. You know, I'm sure these are outlier situations. But, you know, I've heard many stories about people having to rip up T-shirts um, to use as pads uh, at, in our homeless shelters. And I'm wondering if we could get very specific, like, do you have on the RFP, the Request for Proposals, an indication that menstrual products must be made available? And then is that part of your checklist, you know, as um, um, DHS, um, you know, goes around to see what's going on at each of the shelters, is that on the checklist to look for menstrual products? Sure, so let me, um, thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, I wanna start by just acknowledging that when the introduction was first introduced, um, it only covered families with children shelters and single adult women shelters, as well as domestic violence shelters. Recognizing that we know that individuals menstruate across all of our shelter systems, we expanded the definition of temporary shelter um, in that bill for the A version, which is incredibly important for the agency and the work that we do to cover single adult men's shelter as well as our HASA shelters. Um, in regards to the process, um, they do differ across the DHS system, the HASA system, and the domestic violence, the domestic violence shelter system. However, pads and tampons are available at all of those locations. So the way that the agency does this work is we purchase the products from DCAS. Those products are then delivered to our warehouse, and then we deliver those, pro or excuse me, we make available to the shelters um, based on the census of the shelter. So that is a much larger count than individuals menstruating in the shelters. Um, those products are provided monthly. At DHS direct run sites, are, they are delivered. For non-direct site, non -direct run sites or provider sites, we work with uh, a contractor to deliver those products and or some providers uh, will pick them up from the warehouse as they do with mo many products that are available at the DHS warehouse. Um, we have signage across the shelter system indicating to clients that these products are available to them and how to go about getting those products um, should they need them. Um, so the products are available. In terms of concerns around quality, um, we did do a review of complaints to our info line. That was not something that we were hearing, but I want to encourage clients that 
they're having issues with access or quality of these products, to please speak to the providers, to call the ombudsman's office so we're made aware of that and we can address the issue. We want to make sure that products are available to clients and there's not barriers to access. So I love that answer and I'm sure all of that is accurate. Um, so thank you for that and thank you for extending access to the other shelters. Um, but it sounds like it's a complaint driven system and that, um, uh, which is different than an intentional check at every facility as part of the checklist of how is this facility doing to check in about menstrual products. And so I'm just wondering, is it on the list of things that you inspect for? Um, so I can certainly follow up in terms of if there's language specific in the RFP. I know that's something that you asked. Um, and then any spot checks that the agency is doing at the shelters. I can follow up on that. So um, I, I mean this with all due respect, um, um, but so um, uh, um, so you're going to get back to us about whether or not it's required in the contract, and you're going to get back to us about whether or not that question is asked or you know information about that is collected on the spot visits. So I want to I just want to be clear. So in terms of like the feedback loop that we have with providers, providers yeah. go no, it through sounds like reordering no. procedures. Um, but if a client has a complaint or a concern like the one that you raised in terms of um, you know the example of a client potentially using a shirt or other other cloth materials, um, you know, that could be about access, it could be about quality, it could be about stigma. Um, and we want to create an environment in which individuals come forward, um, not only to request the items that they need and get support while menstruating, um, but have an environment in which that stigma is decreased. Right. Um, no, I get that. I guess what I'm saying is that when the person called my office, it was not the individual who experienced it. Mm -hmm. It was about a surprise uh, uh, that her 12-year-old daughter experienced. And um, I'm not sure my office even knew. I'm thinking back on it now because I think I may have called you about it, but I'm not sure I knew even which shelter. So I just want to get across that, and maybe, and maybe Director Ebanks will talk about this in the task force she's convening, that it it in there are situations where there's not a culture of support um, and that perhaps that should be looked at you know I know you're looking at a million things but um, and I'll try to remember which shelter sure. any details would be helpful yeah um, but it is the problem of a complaint driven system that um, you know, especially on stuff like this, it can be said about many other issues, which society makes women feel embarrassed about, which is perhaps the most ridiculous uh, and clear indication of a patriarchal world. Um, but there it is. Lastly, um, and perhaps this is a question again for your task force director, but. I'm wondering if you could look at it from the perspective of um, procurement as a mechanism to track spending on menstrual products. And I would look at both separately tampons and pads um, for each of the agencies. I mean, it sounds to me like if DHS is um, purchasing them and sending them directly to city-owned facilities and then having them available at warehouses, then it'd be pretty easy. I mean, it just strikes me as something that's pretty easy to identify as an OTPS product. Yeah. Um, and, you, thank you for that, uh, council member. And every agency can indeed tell you quantities purchased and procured and the procurement process. 
I think one of the things we struggle with is procured, as, as uh, Deputy Commissioner said, uh, they have a distribution channel, a procurement process, and a distribution process. Yeah. The, the, where we believe, and what I also think the Menstrual Equity Work Group will do, is look at that end user experience and how can we more directly link you know, the procurement and distribution process to the end user experience so that it is a more satisfying experience and responsive experience. Yeah, and it so, sounds like if it all goes through, apologies. No, 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 go ahead, no. If it all goes through DCAS, perhaps they just have a line item in their budget and that'll answer the question for the whole city. I don't know where it's, DOE. It's, it's one thing we can we can certainly look at. Please. Yep, and I'm. We'll do, that's we'll the we'll end. We'll, we'll, we'll do another round. No, thank we'll you very we'll much, another, and thank you, Chair. And then I'll come back with my questions back to DHS yep. and how I think they can okay. put their data. Thank you so much, Chair Diaz, for holding today's uh, hearing. Thank you, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner, for being here. Um, really quick questions. We're talking a lot about uh, quantity. I want to talk about both quantity and quality. Um, and as uh, Councilman Rosenthal stated, we've had several conversations with agencies and with clients in the shelters and principals at schools regarding the quality of products. And I just wanted to know what considerations or changes are being made regarding uh, age appropriate products especially through this pandemic. We know a lot of kids may be remote, a lot of kids may be, students may be um, at school, but what are we doing about age appropriate products in shelters as well in schools? Um, at this time, I, I venture to guess from our stats, it, it, it is, um, we don't know about age appropriate, but we know about um, you know, heavy flow, wings, just the different types of, right. of uh, sanitary napkins, but also tampons. So management of flow, things like that, is, is what we are most clear on. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where I think it's a gap in, in what we collect now. Mm -hmm. Now, DCAS works with some of the agencies, and some of the agencies have a separate process. Um, everybody is willing to address any gaps identified as quickly as they're identified. And I think the beauty of our working group is that we will begin to document that. Mm -hmm. And also, we will have sharing of learnings and experiences. And so I think what it gives us as the laws launched, you know, as a city, we're leading in the provision of these products. Now I think we're leading in coordinating the management and the experience of the product. And this is what this hearing has given us a chance to to crystallize, right. and so we hope that subsequently we'll have a fuller story to say, to tell, and one that is readily infused with the end user experience, and that um, we certainly are striving to be intentional in our service to New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or background, and we want to be able to do so equitably. So would it be decast to monitor and enforce particular sites based off everything that you just I think shared? it's not yet determined. I think, I think that's to... really important to know, uh, especially during the pandemic and we're dealing with students who are transitioning to being menstruating individuals. Absolutely. We need to understand what that is during this time. So if, the, if that could be included in the conversations that are being had, um, that would be helpful to ensure that one, quality, because I know that that's something that's important, mm -hmm. but two, that those conversations are being had now and that we know that. Um, I'm gonna jump a little bit quickly into still quality, um, but safer options. Now, granted, pe people, menstruating people need feminine, need these products, right? But the quality may not be the best for everyone. Um, are they organic? Are they cotton? And usually, uh, people that look like myself um, usually will be given something that actually causes more harm as opposed to addressing the current problem. So I wanted to know if your agency, or maybe DCAS, is having conversations with maybe MWBEs or other companies about providing a more organic option. I'm unaware of that conversation, but we can check on that. 
if that could be considered, because um, we know that there, there's also a, another fight, um, and this was a, a huge fight to be provided with uh, products, menstru menstruation products, but then there's another fight of products being given to black women um, that actually cause more harm to our bodies, causing fibroids and things of that sort. So, and I know this is super innovative and this is super creative, but if we could consider an organic option to be given out, especially to young women who are menstruating uh, and may consider one day wanting to be birthing people uh, in New York City, that this doesn't adversely affect them, giving them products that actually don't help. Absolutely. And, and, um, and the last question I have, um, if that's okay with you, Chairwoman, this is the last question, I promise. Um, what, are, what is your agencies doing collectively or have you been thinking about how do you reach out to the immigrant community mm -hmm. in making sure that they have access to um, menstru menstrual products? And I ask this because most of the time when I hear from parents in my district or my surrounding districts um, in Brooklyn, they didn't even know that this was an option to get free menstruating products for their kids and then, you know, students are remote at the moment. So what's being done in order to have those conversations with immigrant communities? In the normal course of business, uh, we use multiple languages, signage, and also our social media channels. Um, this clearly is an area where we need to improve. Um, nothing is more painful than to have a law and that provides a wonderful service and nobody knows it exists. So, we, I can commit here that we're really going to look at effective and frequent communication through the myriad channels that I think exist both within the school system, wherever the population needs it. And I think that's one thing, I don't think, I know that's one thing the menstrual equity group will also focus on because we have this, we were pioneering as a city in providing these resources. Mm -hmm. We need to be diligent in ensuring that it is fully accessed and utilized. So thank you for raising that as well. Thank you. We'll Before we, we move on, I'd just like to suggest for family, for those that are the providers, perhaps the question is in the monitoring tool. If we cannot put it into the RFP, but the monitoring tool or when the administrators are asking the clients when they do the, the room visits, just kind of just throw it in there as a conversation but then is also in reference to signage from someone that has worked the system, I've never seen a poster sign in the lobby, feel free to ask. Right. And more horrifying, also reflecting on hearing the stories from the single women shelters. Right. We definitely need to make more effort and be a little kinder and gentler to our individuals that live in, in single shelters. So I, I love to walk through William's shelter and, and see that it's friendly and that it's available, not that one has to feel stigmatized by it. Moving on to your presentation, Ms. Erin. I don't have testimony. You today. don't have one? Just okay. For Q &A. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I, kinda, and I don't I want you just, to prepare uh, and then let's cut it short because we just got into the muster, okay. right? <laughs> and, and if I may, I would like to add, Chair Diaz, that yes. um, Individuals should feel free to reach out to the Commission on Gender Equity at genderequity at cityhall.nyc.gov. And so they should really see us also as a place where they can raise concerns. We will connect with our colleagues in the various agencies and work to resolution as well. Unfortunately, not many of us know that you exist. Uh, I didn't know of it till I came in last December. We totally understand I, you know, that. No punt intended, but if you're a resource, we need to know that, that you're available and maybe we can do be better partners in government in highlighting your availability. Sure, and that's why I'm sharing it today, recognizing. No, I thank you. Yeah, we have to figure out a way. A DHS memo. Oh, okay. Okay. Before I go to my second round of questions, Ms. Rosenthal, any questions? No? Good. Thank you so much, Chair. You're welcome. Fire questions? Anything else? Okay. So we're going to get to COVID-19. I'd like to hear about the practices and lessons learned and how we continue serving New Yorkers during the pandemic, 
when it comes to distribution of, san of sanitary napkins at the pantries. We can get that information for you. I don't have information about that. We do know that it was provided and available because one of the things we had to pivot was to figure out what were the accessible points in communities that people could get to given the stay at home order, things like that. And it, it seemed that the, the food banks became a central venue for that option. From the food banks. And then also, as we were giving out meals at the hubs, right. were they also made available? Yes, we were giving out at, at the schools. At the schools? At the schools, where, where meals were made available at schools, um, DOE disseminated uh, there. My understanding is the last day was September 10th? Yeah, because schools are now fully back in session and they have their existing process um, where each building has a budget and the custodial engineer is um, responsible for uh, servicing that building regarding the, the needs. And so they have a budget to purchase the menstrual products and to keep the bathroom stocked now that schools are back in session. So, we're, so the guidance council perhaps, that gui the parent coordinator, who at, who at each school decides what menstrual products are purchased? And is that the reason why one school they, to they, the other, they, they vary? I'm, I'm trying to figure. They, they, you know, I don't have a, a, a response in terms of what they, who decides what products, except that there's a budget available to purchase dispensers, pads, tampons, and there's a catalog of products that custodial engineers access. This is the DOE process. And uh, with that, they're the responsible to keeping the restroom stocked of these products. It does put a burden, we acknowledge, on students when the, when the machines are, the dispensers are empty, uh, but we leave it at the local level for the uh, buildings to stock the restrooms with the products. Could you perhaps in the near future provide myself, the committee, with samples of what the schools are actually purchasing? We can, sure. Please do, because I'm we hoping will. that we can have some wings at it and the quality, and I would love to know the experience of the individuals that are purchasing these items. Yes. Chairwoman, I think that's part of the concern that we've been hearing for the last year and a half. I think, well, two years now, I would say. Um, I think part of the issue is the janitor is making decisions. Right. Um, there's no one else in the schools making the decisions. So I think when we're talking about enforcement, when we talk about monitoring, I think we need to consider other leaders within the schools that can actually help with decision making and actually hearing back from the students on what the actual needs are. Thank you. I have Thank heard you. numerous times that the janitor is the one purchasing. And typically. I mean, he are. may be a super dad and have experience. That's great. But it's still left to be seen. Thank you. By chance, would you know as individuals during COVID were moved into, into hotels, were the hotels also supplied with the sanitary products? Do we know? That's right. So throughout the pandemic, um, DHS made available a uh, range of items, PPE, and it also included making available menstrual products uh, to those de-density hotels that the agency or providers were in. Thank you. Do you know, but I mean, again, it's just a random thought. Will we know, is there data somewhere that we can, I, I like to know that we don't have sanitary napkins sitting in a locker in a hotel somewhere. Was there any tracking at all or we just, we gave it away and on good faith thought it would be distributed and how similar to the process for DHS, you know, like as a provider, we go and pick up from Flatlands was that also how it was done for the hotels? How would we know if, if right. there was a need? Yeah, that process remained the same um, in terms of how providers would go about uh, getting those items. Uh, it was the while same? They were, yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Oh, thank you for reminding me. We'll get back to that, the $1,000 that we agree was not enough. I had to download a calculator to my phone, I gave up, I was like, oh, I know I'm sp I spent more <laughs> than $1,000. Do you have an, uh, so my budget questions, Ms. Rosenthal isn't here, so uh, I'll, I'll ask on her behalf. <laughs> the, the question, fiscal, fiscal 2022, do we have an idea of how much money um, has been spent Tampons versus pads? Um, yes, we do. And I'm trying to make sure that I, okay. um, you know, I have data here. I just want to make sure that I am giving for the right uh, entity. Um, the Department of Corrections um, over has an annual spend on, estimated annual spend on uh, from FY17 to FY21 of $15,823 on TAM bonds, regular. We can provide this to you um, using, they use always maxi pads with wings, they have a size. Oh, well, they do, nice. Yes. Can we give it to all of This is DOC, it's very, very detailed that, that, that they provided an annual cost over five years of 82,000. This was a size two. There is an always maxi pads with wings, size five, heavy. Um, that has a lower annual cost of 7,300. And then we have a, although this is discontinued, uh, there was an expense around uh, generic sanitary pads, but now discontinued of 29,000. So- and, and the generic pads? Yes, but it's, it has now been discontinued. Do we also know that the generic pads are likely not to be hypohygienic? We have no idea, but okay. um, DOC has discontinued that. And um, I'm going to try to find, uh, I don't have, hold on a minute. I think DOE is looking at annual costs of about 116,000. 116,000 annual costs? 116, But I will, um, actually these may be six month, six month costs. So I will confirm with DOE um, to get annual Does costs. anyone monitor when a product has been discontinued and the reasons to why, meaning I bought, was a, a sale, Amazon, Groupon, however I got it, I bought six boxes, and now after I purchased them, I learned that there's an issue with the company, so I'm gonna trash it, but I'm wondering What's your process if anyone has that follow-up? We, we can certainly um, investigate that further per agency, okay. but um, you know, I, I would think one of the things certainly influencing it is reports of dissatisfaction from users. Okay, I think that would speak to the question that Ms. Lewis had earlier. Can you, and, and just to clarify for application, we're, we're all friends here. Generic pad me, would mean maybe one thing to me and to you something else. Me, so I, generic pad to me is a, a no brand. With, with um, I am simply reporting that at one, at one point they use what they call generic pads, which means that it would not have been affiliated with a particular brand. Okay, or no okay. frills. Versus the, the other categories was very specific that they use always as the brand. So at, at, there's, at one point, the um, Department of Corrections eliminated the use of generic sanitary pads. I well, can't speak to the, to link to brand pads and tampons. So with tampons, they're using Tampax and um, with sanitary pads, they're using always. What drew, the, drew you all to make that, that decision? It was why? I, I don't have the, the rationale. That we don't have here. the why? I don't know what, the, what information they had that shifted okay. the purchase, the behavior. 
Do we have just an idea? I, mean, I don't expect you're gonna have the answer for me, but I would love to know. Per pad, what are we spending? Ooh. Then I, I don't. Because, you know, per agency, not, they're not, they're, they're, if, if they're we can purchase, at least, so folks that are incarcerated, yeah. if you bring it down to one agency, but yeah. you, have, you have numbers to that? We can, we can find out because they're purchased in, in cases, right? So mm -hmm. like a case of 500, but we, we can, we'll do the math and get that to you. Okay. I mean, because this, this is a Tampox product and so is this. Yeah. And they both claim to be regular and then they're not. Like one is more efficient than, than the other by my standards. So it would be important to see what's being thought of. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Wow, great. Do we, the question, oh, in reference to, to spending, do you see or you saw that you had to increase spending? Did you have to make a budget modification to ensure that the food hubs were able, were able to receive the, the, the food pantries or was it as simple as looking at stock and saying the children are not in schools, we could do this way and regularly my understanding population and, sh and shelters have, have gone down a little bit, were we able to just move? And then also as we have individuals that are out, that are in, living in the street, do we have a system in place when we go provide urgent care to have them available? So it was kind of two questions. So I'd happily take the second question. Um, in regard to making products available to individuals who are experiencing homelessness on the street, um, our street outreach teams do have menstrual products available to them, so it's not that we're directing clients to go to an external party like Urgent Care, for example. Those products are made available directly to them through the work of our outreach teams. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And in, in the case of during COVID-19 and, and linking to um, food hubs for, for, the, for DOE, yes. the first order of business was um, taking care of the stock that was already on hand and distributing that through, through the process so that you know we, we, we've sort of been working remote. They have been working remotely for about two years. It was important to um, consume or use what was already um, purchased on hand. So that was their priority through the process and distribute them. Interesting. I'm just hoping that the, the glue that's used, the adhesive rather, right? Because we know we leave something in shelf life, it's only gonna have us so much shelf, shelf life. <laughs> so maybe we can send a memo or thought, you know, I, I know within the food industry, when a case comes in, a date is put on it. So I'm hoping that the janitor who maybe has never experienced having to buy sanitary napkins or, or knows that the adhesive but it'll last for so long knows so they have to be discarded and or at least warn the child or whoever's receiving them to practice some caution. Exactly. The I fiber may be good but not the adhesive. And I think that was certainly one reason why it was important to use what was, was already on hand oh, okay. and, and ensure that it was distributed and not remaining for what turns out to be two years, right? So that, Great. that, that was Great. important. Thank you. Is there a system in place that for year, to year to year we're able to track need? So in 2019, it was an odd year, but prior to you know, 2016 to, to now, have you, have you had a need to ask for an increase in funding to be able to supplement the need? Hmm. If that makes my question I think we, we probably use a general census of you know, each each um, agency as, as, as the guide. And so I think probably could it be done differently? That's something we would investigate in our working group. But right now I think census becomes the base. And as Deputy Commissioner stated, they using the whole census of a shelter system, not everybody there menstruates, so you're kind of uh, budgeting higher than the um, population. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, so our, our expenditure in DHS in, in FY17 was higher than what it was in FY21. 
And part of that has to do with, as the director stated, our initial orders were based off of census and then providers okay. are reordering based on their supply needs. Um, so those budget adjustments do get made um, at six month periods based on um, the orders that we are making and then the monthly reorders that providers are making um, as they need to, to reestablish their supply. Okay. Definitely um, interesting question, and I hope I'm interested in hearing your, your answer because I don't know how you would come across these numbers if you had to. In, in reference to the demographics of who's actually using um, the products, you know, and, and maybe one way I would use to determine is community based, right? Uh, do you have a, a need more so in the 37 consumatic district? which we know financially, you know, there are definitely some, we, have, we lack resources as opposed to, you know, somewhere else in Park Slope. Do you see higher demands or requests um, at any time? Yeah, we, we don't have that information at this time, but okay. it's something that we could look into per okay. agency as we Just interested in, in knowing what the need but is and if we have to allocate good. or reallocate some of the funding, it's a great opportunity to do that. Okay, I think I'm done. Meaning, one second, please. Again, one of those questions that I'd be impressed if you have an answer for. <laughs> Do you have a goal of how many individuals you'd like to serve mm -hmm. in a year? I mean, the agency's goal is to be able to provide the, you know, services that clients need across the board, whatever that might be. Um, and so I think in terms of the signage, making sure that clients are aware that these products exist for them to uh, gain access to, um, creating a safe environment for conversations to be had around menstruation, whether it be for a child or the individual themselves, and irrespective of the type of shelter that a client is placed in, um, that that's the experience that a client has. Hmm. I mean, I, you know, I, and I, I just want to um, underscore that, that as, as you know, as a city, we're here to serve New Yorkers. So part of our challenge is really unearthing the need, which is how do we communicate that this resource is fully, is available to ensure that we have uh, the majority of the individuals who need it, knowing that it's available and being able to access it. And I think that's something, you know, we can certainly do better on because it will give us a true cost to the issue of mental equity. It will help us identify the gaps. We know we're meeting some needs. We know we're not likely to have met all. And so again, I just want to talk about this working group mechanism that this this um, hearing has caused us to, to um, create as a, cat as a catalytic force for us to do deeper work around this and to really um, deepen the impact or extend the impact of the laws that were created. Thank you. Th thank you for your answers. Do we have someone that wants to? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Looking forward to your feedback. Our next panelist, thank you. Thank you for waiting. Somewhat intense. Ms. Jennifer Wise Wolf, the Brennan Center. Thank you for being patient with us. We look forward to hearing from you today. Sit down. There we go. Hi. Hi. It's nice to be here. I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm so thrilled to have listened to all of 
all of this information. Um, I have notes that I almost don't need because I'm kind of feeling responsive to everything that I've just heard. But um, so you may know that I was involved in this law from the start with yes. uh, then council member Julissa Ferreras Copeland. Uh, back, we met in March 2015, which was when the New York City laws were first hatched. Um, beyond getting into some of these really important questions about implementation, I think just for a bit of reflection, it's important to remember that back when we started talking about this and back when New York City started taking action, nobody else in the country was doing this. The laws that were passed here, Local Law 82, 83, and 84, were the first of their kind in the world. Um, there was, New York City was the first jurisdiction in this country to use the frame and the phrase of menstrual equity to consider the different ways public agencies could um, ensure that menstruation wasn't something that was excluded or otherwise um, didn't, you know, kept people from, from being full active participants in our city and in our democracy. Um, and it has set the standard um, for the world. Uh, there are now multiple major cities, over 20 U.S. states, including New York State, um, and other nations that have taken on this issue, led by New York City's example. So I think that's really an important place to start. I recognize that implementation and execution of these laws is a really serious question right now, and I'm actually just kind of overwhelmed and, and, and thrilled to hear the level of questions and answers that are being exchanged over how to ensure what New York City set out to do is actually achieved. Um, but I do think it's important to remember that when New York City did this, it was novel. Um, the laws as they're written, it's funny, I would rewrite them now. Um, I've seen how they've worked in other places. I've seen how they haven't worked in other places. I've seen how our country and how the world has warmed to this issue and this policy agenda. Um, and also I think our collective understanding of the kinds of inequities that plague us um, have become all too crystal clear throughout the pandemic. Um, and that all lends itself to constantly recalibrating and reimagining what menstrual equity can look like in our society. So I had written actually a bunch of notes with questions about, um, with questions about implementation. And I say this as a policy advocate and an attorney, not somebody who's boots on the ground, not somebody who's deeply connected in communities, but often hears feedback through email and, and questions that come my way. Um, and so I've absolutely heard anecdotally that implementation is a problem in, every, in, in the three agencies. Um, and I think that, um, I think that the, the phrase that was used before by the other council member who was here about complaint driven action or activity, yes. yeah, is a really important way to frame it because whether it's a request or a complaint or a concern, we cannot have laws that rely on the most marginalized and the least powerful having to make their demand. It needs to be the other way around in every way. So. My, my comments that I had written about implementation, I think are things it sounds like that you're all already um, in tune to. Um, and I will be grateful to participate in any way as you consider um, how to improve implementation and how to improve execution. Um, and also to help make the connections with not just other grassroots activists here in New York City, um, in New York State, but around the country and around the world that are, that are grappling with the same. Um, all of us, I think, are in a different position and place than we were in 2016 um, when these laws first you know, saw the light of day and we should, we should benefit from and utilize that collective knowledge. Um, even, even if things look different in Los Angeles or things look different in a rural town in West Virginia, menstruation is utterly universal. Um, and I think that, that um, as the commission um, forms and, and considers these questions, bringing in our fellow New Yorkers is very important. I think it's also important to bring in folks who are doing this around the country um, to get their feedback. Some of the things though that I'll, I'll say that I think are different just about the world now and that New York City would be wise to, to include and consider as it re, you know, reimagines how these laws work um, are to, to broaden the scope 
of public agency reach. So when, when these laws were passed in 2016, the DOE and the DOC and um, Department of Homeless Services were the three agencies, quite frankly, that were most willing to engage on this. But there are surely other public agencies and public facilities in New York City that would benefit from ensuring menstrual access, whether it's our libraries, whether it's our parks, whether it's our public buildings. I didn't go in the bathroom here to check what the situation is in City Hall. Um, but whether it's benefits offices, um, whether it's the ability to use public ID to ensure vouchers or discounts on menstrual products, I think that there's a wide variety of creative um, outlets that, that New York can and should consider. Um, in doing so, it wouldn't it be necessarily as groundbreaking as it was in 2016, because there are already other jurisdictions doing things like that. But again, New York City, I think, putting them together and acknowledging that menstrual access and this lens of menstrual equity, looking at all our laws through this lens um, is what makes it special and is what made these laws special. And I think that would be a way that New York City would also um, once again, you know, be at the, the vanguard and, and, and show the rest of the country how this can be done and how this can be done well. Um, I wanna share a couple of other anecdotes that that I've received and written about um, over the past year, and especially during the pandemic. Um, one was the situation that, um, the circumstance that you spoke of earlier about the meal hubs um, providing menstrual products when the schools closed. I think it's just worth noting that in the complaint paradigm here, it was kids who brought it to the city's attention. Um, there was two teenagers in Queens um, and they were covered on NBC News and I had worked with them. Um, they were the ones who raised the fact that the schools were closed and presumably the menstrual products were inside and they were outside. Um, so again, I think just remembering some of the genesis of this is an important piece of the conversation. But another story that came my way and I wrote about it in 2020 um, was somebody who was arrested during the initial protests um, after George Floyd was murdered and was denied menstrual products while in police custody. Um, and was left to basically, yeah. with cuffs on her hands, have somebody help her take out a tampon. She got, no, she got no replacement for it. So from there on, she had to just bleed on the floor. And this was in a room with, you know, however many other people, many, as she told it, were jammed into the room. It wasn't like she got a private restroom or a place to actually go take care of this. And this was somebody who was arrested for peaceful protest. Um, so I think that, again, collecting those stories and remembering that just the public agency paradigm on which we've come to rely, you know, corrections, education, and um, homeless services isn't enough. This, it intersects with every aspect of our lives, whether we are on the streets, whether we are in the parks, whether we are using a public library, um, whether we are just, you know, going about our business in every which way. Um, so I would just urge the city council um, and, and the administration and everyone who is so thoughtfully considering this. And again, I'm kind of over the moon thrilled to hear the level of discourse and Q&A and back and forth on it um, because I've not been privy to any of that. And these laws that I feel very, very proud of and protective of to some extent, um, I'm, it's, it's implementation is is as important as passage, maybe if not more so at this point. I, I'm glad we've been able to provide an opportunity for you to be engaged and more hands-on and seeing what your efforts have led to. Yeah, no, it's definitely. It's it's, um, it's, it's kind of nice, the casual nature of this. Sorry, I'm going to say it's pretty cool. It um, is cool, <laughs> of course. Of but course. Um, And then the last thing I want to just share is um, I imagine folks followed the news out of Scotland last year when Scotland passed its free period products law. And it was, it was kind of humorous to me at the time that Scotland was heralded as the first nation in the world to have such a law, which in fact it is. But I would always remind everybody that Scotland is half the size of New York City. So, you know, just to turn our attention back to this incredibly large, diverse, beautiful jurisdiction where, where we, you know, where the standards I think really were first laid. But what Scotland did, um, which is I think exceptionally creative and and uh, meaningful, um, especially in light of all the discussion that was had prior, is they acknowledged that the frame period poverty. I'm using air quotes here 
is almost a faulty frame, that it's not always just economic detriment, although that is a huge component, but it can be everything from lack of education to lack of safety in, in one's life, whether it's as a victim of domestic violence or a person who is trans who does not feel safe on the streets or in the agencies that are there, presumably to serve them. And then with COVID as the extra layer of lack of access, people who couldn't leave their houses, where safety nets were strained and, serve, and social aid service agencies didn't run as planned or had to run you know, in, with, with all kinds of modifications. The, the way Scotland has addressed this is by creating a voucher system. Um, and I'm the sorry, what did you say the voucher system was created? Scotland. In, in um, November 2020, the law was passed and it went into effect um, in early 2021. Um, and it's, it's, it's in the early, they, they also have a three period products in schools um, standalone legislation, um, but the voucher system is new um, and it would be probably an extraordinary experience to connect the city council with the members of Scottish parliament who spearheaded that, but they're, they're terrific women and very accessible. Um, but I think that that was something that was considered by the, uh, at least the city council member and I, back in 2015 when we first started talking about this, we considered how perhaps the city's free ID um, could be used um, as a partial voucher system uh, for menstrual products. So I just throw that idea out there again to say if New York can do it, everybody would do it, and that it, it sort of gets around some of these implementation questions and also the questions of power dynamics um, and, and the, the, the lack of agency often felt by those who are most marginalized. It gets to the questions of even of quality of products that were asked prior that people would have their own choice to purchase what they want. Um, so I put that out there as, a, as an idea that's still sort of in formation, but is, but is being considered and already underway in other countries and again, feel such um, pride that New York City and New York State have been such um, so much at the vanguard of this issue that um, I have no <laughs> no no fears about saying New York City should keep doing that um, and and continue in that role. But anyway, those are the thoughts that I came here to share this morning. Um, as somebody who's been involved in this issue for um, many years now um, and helping legislatures around the country frame. Um, and, and um, pass legislation, not again involved generally in implementation. Um, that's the perspective I bring to you all and the offer to continue to help, um, to help advance that here in New York City. Um, so I, those are my remarks for this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, but I thank you for holding this hearing and I thank you for allowing me to share some of my um, uncensored thoughts, not the ones I wrote down. And, um, and I would be thrilled to continue to support New York City in its effort to, to ensure menstrual equity for all um, and to lead the country in the world. Well, as I thank you <laughs> for your efforts and for taking our time to be here today and to share with me and New York City, um, letting us know that other countries, other states have moved forward on the conversation that's here. I'm eager to hear on how other states are implementing the process. You know, I, I'm sure we can learn from each other. You know, so again, thank you. Thank you for your participation. Definitely we'll follow up on, on the voucher system because as I was hearing earlier, for the last that te the testified, I was wondering what was our process and if we had a process or thought for allocating funds to benefits you know, how do we know, you know, looking to see how we could improve the process. Not everyone that is in need of sanitary napkins goes to a food hub mm. or goes to a pantry. And as we know, HRA benefits are limited and not necessarily has anyone thought that we would have to have added some feminine, feminine products to the individual's budget. So I, I'm definitely glad to have heard from you today. Thank you. And, I, and I'll just add one more sidebar quickly. That I have a new piece that's going up this week that's urging Congress um, in the throes of the um, planning around now the $3.5 trillion budget um, and, and the reconciliation process to please include menstruation in all of its considerations, especially given that it has been so focused 
on the plight of mothers during the pandemic, that mothers too are people who menstruate, who often have children and family members who menstruate. Um, and as President Biden even single-handedly increased the amount of SNAP benefits that goes into effect right, in October, $36. Right, $90 and now it's $45 is it's gonna, gonna continue? It's gonna be up by $36 um, starting in October, but it would be thrilling if we could have a similarly um, considered uh, expansion to include menstrual products I that agree. doesn't require having I, to I agree. negotiate I, the farm As bill. I've been sitting here today, I'm trying to figure out how. Um, well, I, yeah, I, I won't, I won't, <laughs> I won't Would listen be. to It'd the be microphone. Great. It'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who's testifying today? No one over there? Mm -hmm. This ends the, the hearing today. We conclude. Thank you for those that participated. Thank you.